Hi everyone, and welcome to the Just In Time Cafe's webinar. I'm Tracy O'Rourke, co-founder of the Just In Time Cafe. I'm going to be your moderator today, and today's webinar is titled "How to Use Hope as a Game-Changing Leadership Strategy." Who doesn't need a little more hope today? And it's going to be, it's, you know, the restlessness of today's business environment is not going away anytime soon. So joining us today for this webinar is leadership impact coach Sunitha Narayanan to learn how to practice hope as a skill. She's going to teach us. How are you today, Sunitha? I'm doing fine. And thank you so much. You got the, my last name so perfectly for that. I thank you dearly. Oh, good. Thank you. Good. Wonderful. Uh, well, you know, Elizabeth did tip me off on how to say it correctly. So that was really nice of her. So let me tell you a little bit about Sunitha before we get started. She's a certified executive and leadership coach. She helps clients build an authentic life by helping them notice how they get in their own way, how they get in other people's ways, and how they can honor and ask for what they need. So important. Uh, and to do the work that matters deeply to people. Sunitha is genuinely curious how to use courage, vulnerability, resiliency, hope, and difficulty to build a life full of promise. So I cannot wait to hear how to help make hope a game-changing leadership strategy, Sunitha. So before we get started, um, just a few housekeeping notes. You can ask questions anytime by entering them in the chat window. As a matter of fact, Sunitha was telling me that she prefers engagement. She doesn't really like just talking at the, her computer. She likes to hear people engage. And I think she's got a great session to help with engagement. So if you have a question, put it in the chat window and I will uh, feed those to Sunitha as we go through this. And um, these webinars, the webinar will be on recording at the Just In Time Cafe website afterwards and, and sometime next week. And if you haven't shared already, please tell us in the chat window, where are you from? We have people registering from all over the world and we love to know where people are right here, right now. So if you haven't already, type in the chat window your name and where are you from? And we've got a couple people that have already done that. So Diane is joining us from Jessup, Iowa. We have Rachel from Vancouver, Washington. We have Cindy calling from San Marcos, California. What? That's where I went to high school. Um, we also have Wendy from Cleveland and Umberto from Mexico. Welcome. Al uh, that's not, I was going to say hello, aloha. It's hola. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jackie from Cincinnati. So good. Thank you for sharing. I'm really excited about today's webinar. So I'm not going to delay any further. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Sunitha. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy, for that absolutely generous welcome. And uh, everybody, I cannot see your faces, but know that I'm holding you very close in my heart and feel my gratitude uh, because you have set aside a competing engagement to be in today's conversation on how to use hope as a game-changing life and leadership strategy. Uh, so I'm extremely grateful. And like Tracy said, write your questions in. Uh, if we cannot get to the questions, give me a call, email me. I will make time for you because, you know, in the time that we have, we're going to get this helicopter view of what it is as what what we can do to use uh, hope as a game-changing strategy. Because I feel I wake up every day and I see this big sign in front of me, deep doo-doo, next unknown miles. So it's like, how do I move through? How do I move through? So I am really excited to give you three gifts today. They're coming from my heart because this topic matters deeply to me. In fact, when I reached out to Elizabeth, I did not have any content prepared. So before fear could stop me, I sent an email saying, hey, you all seem to have a lot of fun in that just-in-time cafe. Can I join? Can I come and speak to this topic? And generously, Tracy and Elizabeth said yes. So here I am, completely wholeheartedly present with you, learning with you. The so here is what's going to happen. So the three gifts. First, we're going to look at a foundational practice that helps us hold hope, which is cultivating a pause. 
And then I'm going to share with you the why, a business case. So what I'm hearing from my clients, why they believe that hope can be used as a skill set. So more than a concept, more than a value. And the third gift will be, I'll bring you or I'll walk you through two very client-tested um, practices. You know, when I started putting the content together, I had no clue, right? So I went back to my clients and said, what would you like me to spotlight in this presentation? And they very generously, like this generous community, said to me, we want you to talk about the pause. And then we want you to talk about these two particular practices. And I said, well, this presentation will write itself. So here I am. So first, the pause practice. Now, I invite you to close your eyes for this practice. If you're uncomfortable, the practice can be done with the eyes open. So if you're sitting, settle into your chairs, relax your shoulders, feel your spine straighten up. If you're standing, think about your posture. So it can, the pause works either way. So again, I invite you to close your eyes, take a deep inhale, feel it from your belly. And since I cannot hear you, exhale with a whoosh. Big belly breath, exhale with a whoosh. Take another inhale, follow your breath as it enters your body. Allow the breath to gently touch and set aside distractions, tenseness, and tiredness. You are here wholeheartedly present today. For that, as a community, we give gratitude. Place your hand on your heart, invite spaciousness, gratitude, and love, and place this prompt in your heart. The prompt is, the compliment I give myself today is, I'll repeat the prompt, the prompt with great love is, the compliment I give myself today is, continue to follow your breath as it gently moves through your body, and then feel it coursing down your legs and gently warm the soles of your feet. Shift your feet a little to receive the energy and then allow the earth to receive it. As you reflect on your, the compliment I give myself today is, remember this truth. You are deeply, deeply cherished. You are extremely talented. You're committed to building significance and success for yourself and for others. Go back to your prompt. The compliment I give myself today is take another deep breath. Feel, feel your body relax. Feel, feel everything that is clenched, unclenched. Take another deep breath. Exhale. Open your eyes. And then if you're comfortable, share in the chat that Tracy will read out um, the compliment that you're giving yourself today. And as you're doing that, I want to say something about the pause practice. This pause is within you. It's available to you at all times. Here is how the pause actually works. It helps gentle the amygdala, the part of our brain that I call the lizard brain. It's at the base of our spine and where the neck meets. It's a little organ. It's the part of our brain that alerts us to danger. The default responses that we give when our amygdala is activated are really three. We either fight, so we come at combatively, or we freeze, we get paralyzed. Is this the right decision? Is this not the right decision? Ooh, what should I do? Or we flee, so we disengage. Today, the, the extent of disengagement in people is pretty high. I suspect you're seeing that in your own lives and you're seeing that in your colleagues and community. We're seeing that. So then we do passive aggressive things like not respond to an email on time or just not show up, just refuse to give an idea when we could be giving an idea. So when amygdala is on that overdrive, Without a pause, what happens is cortisol, which is the anxiety stress building hormone, it builds in your body and can stay up to 26 to 28 hours in your body. And here is the kicker, which I think is fantastic to know. Neuroscience research tells us that the amygdala can be disconnected or, or you can shush your lizard brain in about 11 seconds. 
So think about that. Would you choose 11 seconds or would you like your body to be running with the cortisol? So Neetha, I, we, I still see the front slide. I didn't know if you needed to go no, to- No, I'm, I'm going to move in a little bit. Okay, I, thank you. I just, I just want to double check. Yeah, yeah we thank have a you. Couple of, we have a couple of compliments in the chat window. Let me know when you'd like me to share some. Yeah, why, why don't we share that while I, then I can finish up my, what I want to say about the pause. Okay, I, that I sounds want to hear great. That. Okay, wonderful. Julie shared the compliment I give myself today is that I'm open to learning even when I'm frustrated. Wonderful. Good for you for showing up, Julie. Yeah. Um, I said that the compliment I give to myself is that I, I deserve kindness to myself. <laughs> I deserve kindness. Be kind to myself. Cindy okay. writes, the compliment I give myself today is that I'm actually very talented and have much to contribute. Yay. And Jackie says, you're still going strong, which is great. Those are the compliments we have in the chat window so far. If you have any additional ones, well, please share. Thank you for sharing that. So here is the thing about the pause. When we pause, we connect to our resiliency, which is a back factor. Um, and when, when we connect to that resiliency at our very core level, we start inviting hope back into our thinking. So hope is the expectancy of a positive outcome on a day that looks very grim. To work through that grimness, we touch our resiliency. The pause allows us to do that. So think about that. When you work from a place of saying, I'm still going strong versus nothing is going right for me today. There's, there's a little, little shift. So some of my clients like physical objects as touchstones when they start the practice. And I'm gonna lean just a second because I left it way back there. Um, so I'll, I'll share with you some of the, my uh, favorite physical objects that I have seen. You know, make this practice your own. This is a very, you can get as goofy as you want with the prompt. This is a very creative pause. The practice of pause is very, very creative. So get as goofy as you want because, hey, it is your practice. So, so why not own it? So my favorite thing to do is use a slinky uh, because it reminds me that when, when the slinky falls, it's still having fun. It, it bounces back. I like how it feels. And there's a story behind this. When I migrated uh, uh, to the United States way, 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 way back when, my mother was ruthless in packing. We were allowed only two suitcases. And each time I put something in, she took it out. So finally, I snuck a slinky into my suitcase and I brought it with me. And this slinky has seen me through a lot of rough times. So think about if you need a touchstone, then pick something. One of my clients puts an exclamation mark between his fingers to remind himself of the awe and wonder around within him and around him. So connects to the self-care. Another client keeps a box of Legos because he loved Legos as a kid and builds something with Lego before going in to give a presentation at a board meeting. My favorite, though, is a cow. One of my clients picked a cow and she has plastic cows around her little uh, computer. And I sent her a pair of socks that has cows on it so she feels centered when she enters those Zoom meetings. So she texted me the other day. She said, what am I going to do when I return to the office? I said, I have no idea. Figure it out, right? So she has bookmarks that are laminated with cows, funny cows on it. And she puts it in her file folder or whatever. And no one's the wiser. They just think it's a bookmark. So own your pause practice. It is really important. The thing I will say, if I were giving you cliff notes about the pause practice, here is what I would say. The pause is within you. The pause reminds you of your resiliency. When you touch your resiliency, you automatically build hope. When you build hope, you connect to possibility. You connect to inspiration because it allows you to make sense of the difficulty. And then you challenge your mindset because there is always another perspective. Even when we don't like that perspective, it's still sitting there waiting for us to engage.
So now you have that pause practice, bring it with you while I share with you why I personally believe and what I'm hearing from my clients about using hope as a skill set. So the first, first thing that they're telling me is that hope is allowing them, like my client put it, he says, pause helps me clear the fog in my mind, in my head. And, you know, uh, Tracy mentioned the restlessness we're all facing. So life is coming at us at a freight train speed. Our response need not be with the same frenzy, right? So familiar practices, this is what I'm hearing the most, that familiar practices of building trust, setting accountability, getting commitment and solving problems has been shaken. So people are thinking, um, I don't know. I don't know anymore. So with that, the pause is helping them slow down and really check with the overwhelm of feelings that is coming up for them. When they check that overwhelm of feeling, suddenly hope appears. So that's one reason. The second reason is, I mean, who doesn't like to build a process? I mean, you can have the clearest goal as possible, but if you don't have a how, if you don't have the roadmap, um, the goals can pretty much fail. And what I'm seeing is what you are probably also experiencing is that everybody is in a firefighting mode. You go from problem to problem to problem to problem to problem, and you rush into solution to solution to solution. So cultivating a pause allows you to slow down the process, allows you to really um, think about breakthrough moments. So you slow down, you, you do a little bit of measured meandering and allow that creativity. The third reason that I'm seeing that people are saying hope is working for them is on these little, little tiny shifts of improvements. You know, practice uh, for me, and uh, I suspect it is for you, for me, practice is a beast. The day I think I have it in hand, I fall the hardest. So practice is slippery, it's elusive, it's in the daily, unordinary, boring things that we have to do that extraordinary moments get built. So when we use hope, we are able to see that tiniest shift, one idea, one conversation, one relationship. That's all we need to own. And it allows us to say just enough is just enough. It's actually pretty extraordinary to do just enough and to show up. And the last reason that I'm seeing is uh, this, this concept called balanced versatility. It comes from the science of neuro-linguistic programming and neuroscience. And it's described as sophistication of integrating two seemingly opposite behaviors so that the range of your influence and your impact um, is expanded. So work is happening with and through people. Uh, so an example of this would be uh, all of you probably will claim analyzing pitfalls as a strength. I'm assuming you would. If I, if I ask for a show of hands, I'm, I'm sure all hands would go up because you're all problem solvers. However, think about this from a perspective of an overuse of that strength. When you overuse a strength, I mean, we are all hired for our strengths, right? No one has ever come to me and said, Sunita, I love those your, your top three weaknesses. Make sure you use them all the time in this project. No one says that to us, right? They're always telling us, well, that's a weakness. Do something about it. But within our strengths lie our weaknesses, lies a blind spot. So when we overuse a strength, it can cause us difficulty. So an example of this, you know, this happens, this gets me into trouble all the time with my husband. Um, he thinks very logically and analytically. He really sucks the energy out of all my conversations, really, because if I take an idea to him, he'll say to me, this won't work, that won't work, this won't work, that won't work. And it could be a vacation, it could be something to do with the kids, anything. So when we overuse, what happens is there's a disconnect between our behavior. Only our behavior is being experienced, our intention rarely is. So, so in one of my clients' situations, um, she prides herself on logic and uses forthright diplomacy. In fact, she gets kudos through her 360 feedback for being very logical, thinking, and making uh, decisions uh, quickly. 
So imagine her surprise when her policy decisions around returning to the office had severe pushback and she was actually called in and told by her supervisor this. She said, she was told, you are being seen as egocentric and uncaring, the opposite of psychologically safe culture that she's known to create. She texted me a really angry text. She said, can you believe what they said to me when all I'm doing is making their lives easier? Disconnect between intention and how the behavior was experienced because she overused her sense of logic and she missed empathy. So when you balance things and you look at sense-making process, improvements and versatility, what happens is you enter life itself with gentling your ego. So you enter with a beginner's mindset with some awe and wonder. So that happens. So you can actually do the work you care about. Then when you move to possibility, I truly believe that each of us needs more than one lifetime to actually use all the gifts and talents that we have. We, we use really a tiny, teeny bit. So today, we have to go beyond our job descriptions. We have to really think, what does discretionary effort look like? Uh, what would I like to try? Uh, what would I throw out of my job description? How would I rewrite this? What do I want to do? Um, and we're not having those conversations. We really are not having them before. And today there is a real urgency to think about what are those untapped gifts. When we talk to people about that untapped gifts, hope automatically shows up and people are energized. I talked about the awareness of the blind spot with the strengths. And then all this goes to making a culture where each voice is invited, each experience is honored just the way people are telling you it's, it's happening to them versus inserting ourselves into their story. So we have to figure out how to get more practice in listening without inserting ourselves into someone's story. Oh, that happened to me. Well, that, that's not too bad, you know. I can, I can tell you something else. So, so the, com the competition of saying my misery is greater than your misery has to really stop, really. So that's why I'm, I'm really seeing that when people use hope as a skill set, it's, it's doing some remarkable things uh, to them. So let's carry the pause, the business case, and then look at some ideas really that um, you know, these are client tested ideas. So I'm going to walk you through two different uh, two exercises. One is naming the fears and the other one is to reduce the dialogue gap. How do we create build shared meaning and then what is a learning community without my asking for you to commit to one action right so as a community let's commit to doing something about this information and figure out how to help each other stay accountable so to set up the first exercise on naming naming the fears I'd like you to think about phrases or words that you might use to describe the world today. So whatever comes up to you, comes up for you. And then uh, we're going to give you a couple seconds and um, Tracy will read, up, read us what's coming up there. Yes. I will share some of my words. Yeah. Scary. <laughs> Scary is one. Mm -hmm. Uh, uncertain is the other. Yeah. Um, you know, chaotic is good too. Yes. So we've got a couple. I'll share a few others if you if that's okay, Sunitha. Yes. Yes. It's great time to do that. Good. Uh, we see from Cindy isolated, fearful, broken. Wendy also said isolated. Juanetta, really good word. Polarized. Uh, Rachel said chaotic, Giselle, conflicted, competitive, pain, Diane, opinionated, absolutely, <laughs> Nick shared unknown, Rachel shared promising though too, so there's an upside there, and by the way, we're about halfway through, Sunitha, you asked me to give you some time, okay. so we're yeah. about halfway through. Okay, so uh, think about those words, and thank you, Rachel, for putting in promising over there. You know, that's a little bright spark over there because none of these words on the face of it are very encouraging. 
they're certainly not hope producing. So that's that's the point, you know, our inner landscape, how we talk about our, how we figure out our inner landscape actually matters. When uh, the more we understand our inner landscape, um, the easier it gets for us to use that pause practice to pay attention to our emotional vocabulary. We are unpracticed with our emotional vocabulary. We tend to say, uh, say things very broadly, good, bad, sad, happy. But, but when we really engage with our inner, inner landscape, so think about it. If I'm leading with feeling scared, what kind of behaviors am I going to lead with? Um, and the case for this really is this, this concept. And I actually, uh, I was hoping Elizabeth would be here because she wrote a great post on uh, LinkedIn on the use of acronyms. And VUCA is uh, fairly well understood in, in business communities and it stands for the volatility, the rate of change, the uncertainty, you know, that a lot of you talked about. The chaoticness comes from the complexity and the ambiguity is really the sense of loss that we are all carrying within us. So I really think, you know, when I imagine all of us scurrying around doing our daily stuff, whatever we are doing, I'm thinking of all of us like from some kind of a movie where we have VUCA pods. We're all like VUCA pods and we're colliding with each other. And that's when that whole opinionated, entrenched, isolated, broken, that's what we are supporting because each of us is carrying this within us. So when we pause to really ask ourselves, what is going on within us? we are able to honor the emotion as it shows up. One thing I do want to say that emotions are not bad or good or not positive or negative. Emotions are data points. Emotions give us a clue of what is going on, what's bothering us, and, and also give us a clue, how can we get through that, whatever is bothering us. So when you do this exercise, the, the the key thing is to remember, honor the emotion the way it is coming up. So, so I'm going to take one example from here and change how you, how you script it. So you could say, I, I, um, I'm scared. When you say I'm scared, the brain automatically activates the amygdala. And the amygdala puts you back into flee, fight, or um, what's the other one? Fear. So if you want to disconnect that, give yourself some distance from that emotional swirl. Don't act as if you are that emotion. So the distance would be, I'm feeling scared because. So you can distance yourself. You can take that exercise a little deeper. You can say, I'm feeling scared because uh, a lot is unknown in our world today. When I feel scared, I act. Think about how you behave. You can say, I say these words, think about the words you use. You can say, I receive, you can think about what the outcome is, then you can say, I give. So what's the experience you're giving to somebody else? So when we pause, we can help people without labeling emotions for them. You know, uh, uh, I never, I, I, I hope we are not doing this. You know, so it's not about me telling Tracy, Tracy, you look really tired today. Or, or to say, what's going on? Your, you know, your face is all scrunched up. Are you irritated? So it's not about that. It's really about saying, let's help each other with our practice of noticing our inner landscape. And we can say, you know, um, what do you think? What do you think the energy with this project? You know, if you, if, if you were picking one through five, where would you place energy level for this project? Take away the personality. You know, what big concerns come to your mind right away as you're listening to me say X, Y, Z? What's coming up for you? Let, let's pause for a second and, let, you know, I, uh, I feel, uh, here is what I'm feeling. What are you feeling? Versus saying, are you feeling the same? No. Even if that person is feeling scared, they're going to feel a different scared. It's their version of feeling scared. So that's the empathy. Do trying not to put ourselves into someone else's shoe, it's to sit with. 
So I don't have another fancy word for that practice. I call it sitting with. So sitting with a person, sitting with the question matters. So let's take that practice a little deeper and go back to my favorite, the amygdala, which I call the lizard brain. Um, so the question here for each one of us is, what happens when we go into a protect mindset for whatever reason? There are unconscious calculators in our mind. Do I like this person? Do I trust this person? Do they trust me? Should I speak up? Will my voice be valued? Uh, nah, it's not worth it. So a lot of that unconscious calculation is going on. So when that affects our behaviors, we go into a protect mindset. There are three ways that the protect mindset really works. If we feel rejected and not included, there is science behind inclusion that actually tells us that on an MRI, it registers as physical injury on the brain. Think about that. That it actually registers as a physical injury. There's also evidence to suggest that people cannot think straight when they feel as if their voice is not invited or included. So, you know, there's all this talk right now going on about psychological safety, which that, that's why that has come up, surfaced again. So when we feel, if we have made up our mind that we, we experience rejection, we're going to, our ability to think, our ability to process information and certainly generate ideas goes out of the window. Then we're just going into fight, freeze or flee mode, right? So the question for you today is, how do you get awareness around what behaviors you're leading with when you're in your protect mindset? So that would be a very generous share from each. You know, if someone's willing to share, because um, it helps, we have to touch our unsanitized stories, because that's the other thing. Neurologically, we are our stories. So again, from the brain's perspective, the brain likes to complete a loop and a cycle. It completes it. The pattern is completed. We get a rush of dopamine, the happy hormone, and we go our way. The kicker is the story does not have to be accurate. So facts do not play into completing a, completing a story. And I'm going to read you a really small little story that, that, that emphasizes this. A team of psychologists asked shoppers to um, choose a pair of socks among seven pairs and to give their reasons for choosing that particular pair. Every shopper had a story behind why they picked that a pair. No shopper said, uh, I don't know why this is my choice. They all talked about subtle differences in color, texture, and stitching. The kicker is all the socks were identical. So when our brain completes a pattern, we go into a protect mindset and we believe that. I think the danger when we go, when we sit in a protect mindset comes with the, our unwillingness or unpreparedness to ask some very difficult questions of ourselves. Um, things like, what am I unwilling to give up? What truly is my fear? What's the real issue for me here? What's stopping me from asking for help? Whole bunch of different questions to engage with. Um, so I'm curious, Tracy, something coming up where people are writing what behaviors show up in their in yeah. a protect mindset? So I, I put both of those questions in the chat. What behaviors show up when I'm in a protect mindset? And then how do we get awareness around what behaviors you share? And while we're waiting, I'll just share that one of the things that happens to me when I'm in a protective mindset is I'm a very talkative person, but I tend to freeze. I tend to kind of stop and I, I start processing in real time. Is this really happening? Um, and and um, what's happening? You know, I sort of freeze because I feel like I'm analyzing it a little more closely. And I feel like I am listening more to see if this is happening. I, I don't like conflict too much. So when things, when there is conflict or fear, I tend to hone in on, is this really something I feel, or is this really happening? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's why we continue to work with those questions. What are my fears really? 
Uh-huh. And how are those fears stopping me from being as close to my purpose? How can I align better to my purpose? Uh, for me, I, uh, with my family, as well, really my husband, I get really sarcastic. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very hurtful. Right. And, and that's, that's not who I am. So it takes me away from the essence of who we are. When, mm-hmm. we, when we stay in that protect mindset, it takes us away. Uh, so feel free yes. to uh, to share any other yes. responses while we I... We have a few more. We yeah. have a few more. So um, not being open. So Diane, and by the way, I thought I put them in the chat and I actually put them in the panelist view. So sorry about that. That was my fault. Um, so Diane said she's just not open. That's how it shows up for her, for new ideas or opportunities. Um, and... That Jackie was saying, Jackie was saying, I tend to want to complete the task by myself without including others. So she, she goes into just do it, you yeah. know, because for whatever reason. Giselle writes, I stop being responsive and restrained motion and can be taken as being disengaged. Restrained emotion, she said. Yeah. Um, so those are some of the things. Wendy said negativity. Um, and then Giselle says she has triggers. So those okay. are some of the things that uh, people are saying, behaviors, how they show up, what behaviors yeah. show up. So part of this is when you think about your protect mindset, the first level is the awareness, right? So doing a body audit, knowing where, where your body is clenching and, and paying attention to that. And then you have to do something about this data point to get out of that protect mindset and move more towards the growth or the hope mindset. I usually turn to play because play automatically gentles people. They remember their childhood. They smile a little more. There's a little bit of joy. Uh, So I'm going to speak to a couple uh, really quickly. I'm going to speak to a couple ways you can use play. Most of you are familiar with moving from yes, but to yes, and it would be wonderful if we, we could take yes, but out of our vocabulary. Oh, I, hopefully we're getting there. I'll talk to the prompts. I like prompts because they can be self-generated. Um, I do take prompts in with me. I always carry index cards, color pencils, and whatnot. And I don't know whether you can see. The, can you see my little? Look at my box. Isn't it pretty? Yes, we can I love see. my Very little nice. box. So I, I usually take this box and have index cards where I I just write these prompts. I've been collecting prompts forever. So if, when somebody gets stuck, I just give them this box and they can pick the prompts or change it. So the way the prompts would work uh, would be, I am, so this particular client picked, I am, I know, I need, I fear. The I will is as a coach, I introduce that because I want practice and accountability. So see how that goes, how that flows. So you can do this with a lot of different prompts. I like the if only and what if, because it's a little distinct from the yes, but and the yes, and. In if only, uh, what I have observed, we go into a victim mentality and we usually blame other people outside of ourselves. If only I didn't have to work with Priya, my life would be so wonderful. If only I could move Tom out of my team, that would be brilliant. If only I could clone myself, whatever the if onlys are. And the usuals, you know, budgets and resources and blah, blah, blah. Then you move it to what if without analyzing. So you go truly into play, meandering, brainstorming. It's it's quite marvelous. All these exercises are individual, paired, and team friendly. Doodling, I am not an artist. Uh, People like Elizabeth Swan, uh, Dorsey Sherman, all these people actually draw, I doodle. That's the basic difference. Uh, but doodling, I found, especially as a team exercise, is very powerful. I, I did an, uh, uh, an engagement last year where uh, the team was discussing a culture of trust and accountability and completely unwilling to set aside grudges. They were really angry with each other. So I had them pair up and doodle what their hopes were. And each doodle was distinct, yet there was a common thread. So when they saw that common thread, automatically they started laughing. They said, what the heck are we arguing about so much for? Let's get to it. Paradoxical pairs are are 
quickly becoming my favorite because it really shushes the amygdala. The pause is very evident when you work with paradoxical pairs. So whatever is coming up for you. So for, for, for example, one of my clients picked overwhelmed and calm, tired and energized, confused and clear. So start with whatever the fear emotion is and then look for the opposite. So then all you're doing is you're noticing. When I lead from feeling overwhelmed, what happens? When I lead from feeling calm, what happens? Tiny teaspoon. This is not an either or kind of amazing Pollyanna kind of thing that, oh, my life is going to be so better if I just embrace hope. No, it's, it's, it's a process. It's a practice. Um, what, what I suggest is do a teaspoon. So what might it take to move? If you did one teaspoon, what would it take for you to move from overwhelmed to calm? One teaspoon at a time and see how that practice works for you. Because then ideas usually get generated. The pause works for you. The amygdala shushes enough. The prefrontal cortex lights up and then hope enters. So that's the first practice. The second practice is about creating shared meaning and all conversations are physiological. You know, we, we, are, we are bringing simmering emotions, especially today, we are bringing boiling emotions into, into our conversations. The emotional center in the brain, though, this is the fascinating thing. The emotional center in the brain is an open loop center. What that means is that we rely on our connections with each other to determine our moods. Isn't that pretty fascinating? So that's where I think the phrase must have come from, leaders get the behaviors they model. And uh, there is one really interesting piece of study uh, where people have, you know, I'm fascinated with what kinds of things people study and I'm very grateful for that. So in a mood science study, uh, one mood science study reports that when three strangers sit facing one another in silence for a minute or two, the most emotionally expressive of the three transmits his or her mood to the other two without a single word being spoken. How powerful is that? So think about it. If you, I mean, we aren't doing this as much as we used to, but if you were in an elevator and someone leans and says, hey, nice pair of shoes, you start talking. But if the same person goes to a corner and is fiddling with their phone, you shrink as well. So, so there, there, there is real power in this. The other piece of research that I want you to think about is we speak at 200 wo 250 words per minute, apparently. But the brain is making meaning at 400 words per minute. Huge gap for storytelling. So think about the fact that conversations are physiological. So there are a couple ways to shift towards hope. The first piece is um, assume you're going to like 10% of what you're hearing. You have 90% to disagree with. Fair? That's pretty equitable, right? The second piece, to do the second piece, think about some conversation or a relationship where you keep getting into trouble, where the outcome usually is something you don't want. It's joyless. So then think about and write down in, on your, in your notebooks and also, also at the chat, what are you hearing from your conversation partner or in that relationship that builds up that cortisol for you? So what are they saying or doing that's shutting you down from staying open? And so then the paradoxical word piece would be, what are some words that actually build the happier hormones where you will lean in with that 10% engagement, lean in with curiosity and it builds endorphins. So I'm going to give you just maybe a second or two so that we can mind time here. If something is coming up, please put that in your chat functions while I populate a couple examples. That sounds really wonderful. And we have about 15 minutes left and I'll just share too, Sunitha, that yeah. um, I'm working with uh, a group right now and they're telling me all the reasons why process improvement won't work there. <laughs> tell you how many times I've heard these these things and I'm like ah it's draining I feel like it builds cortisol like we can't do this or I don't care um you know those kinds of things it's 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 hard it's you know it's hard to but I think this will help 
recognizing that, you know, some of these words are helping me feel that way, right? Yeah. yeah. Not only that, Tracy, I think you can use this with, with the people too. You, you can build that awareness and you can say, hey, here's an exercise, let's play. And then have them do either the if onlys and the what ifs or even alert them to how that language is taking away from hope, taking away from possibility, taking away from imagination. The kicker in this always is it's always easy to point to what someone else is doing because, again, I think as, as, as human beings, that, that is what connects us. We do like to blame. We do like to hold grudges. So it's easy to say, well, if only you didn't say that, I would do better. Versus looking at it from this particular question, well, what are we saying or doing that others might shut down with us? And that's a harder conversation to have with ourselves and to have with other people because we need reasonable trust to go to somebody and say, uh, Tracy, I really want feedback on this. And it works because I have a client who is very solution focused and she was shutting down her team. So she has given permission. So that's where you go. You set and give permission. You get social agreements going. You recognize what you need. Uh, and so she has told her team, when you see me going into solutions, I need you to give me a signal. So she's prearranged that. The, sometimes people are hesitant. So when leaving a meeting, another client, uh, another leader does this. All they ask is, if you are clear about your role after this meeting, give me a five or close your fist. So closing fist is, I'll reach out to you and come and listen to you. So there are a lot of different ways to do things. And the thing that I do want to say is that we don't always have to agree to give up buying. What we do need is to be heard. So someone, if they come and said to me, I hear your concerns, Sunita, I get where you're coming from. I do have to tell you that this project is going to go ahead as is. And what can I personally do to get your buy-in? I'm going to say, really? Oh, oh, and I'm going to get all a little gooey because, oh my gosh, they made a hot connection with me. So that's the piece to think about that. How do we build buying? We build buying with hope. When you say to somebody, the project cannot happen without your skills. I really need your help. When you appeal, when you appeal to the better sense of that the goodness in all of us, all of us have that goodness. We, we, we are having a very hard time today reaching it. Mm -hmm. So, so you have a couple comments in the chat about some examples that people have. Let me share those with you, Sunita. Um, so Cindy said, uh, cortis endorphin building would be, you're so good at that, where um, cortisol building would be, you always sort of like putting people in a trap, like, oh, you know, yeah. Um, so then we have from Jackie, I'm already too busy, which is cortisol building versus um, endorphin building. Let's figure this out together. Yeah. yeah. Um, Giselle wrote, cortisol would be good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. all yeah. the best in yeah. a with a sardonic tone. Um, I wrote, done that already. We, we don't really want to do that again. We've already done that, right? So, you know, they're just kind of poo-pooing on it. Um, and Giselle had a great one for endorphins. It's great learning from you. We have about 10 minutes left as yeah. well. So okay, we so let me go ahead. The reality is when we are in an emotional swirl, the opportunity to flip is very high. So very few of us can, um, I don't claim it, uh, very few of us can actually think on our feet when the emotions are running amok. So one of the great joys in my work is to help people build a conversational toolkit. And this is very individual. It depends on what is going on in their lives and the context that the problem that they're bringing. However, there are three categories that you can always build a conversational toolkit around so that you can throw out a question as pixie dust. You don't have to think that hard. You can shush the amygdala right away by picking up a question from your toolkit and just throwing it out in the conversation. And then watch, invite serendipity. So the three major categories would be emotional agility, where we, where we get better with that emotional vocabulary. Uh, so this would be uh, a let's check energy. Uh, 
you know, what's the excitement level for this project? Where are you with that? Those kind of questions. And then the discovery, you know, challenging the assumptions, the story I'm telling myself about my skills, about other people, about the situation. So those kind of questions. And then insight there co-creating because that's where we need to get to build hope with and for each other so when we come back and put this all together this is here to stay the restlessness is here to stay one of the great takeaway uh, exercises that if you want to try to practice how to build that conversation toolkit i think you already did that when you did the endorphins versus cortisol but you know I would like you to think about return on investment a little differently. Think about return on investment as relevant to the heart. Is, as, is my conversation making a heart connection and inviting logic along? Is my conversation or my phrasing really thinking from their perspective? What am I not seeing? So sometimes even in team meetings, switch seats. Switch seats, move around. I mean, if you're in person. If you're not in person, then I don't know, get up and do jumping jacks. You know, uh, and then the I is the impact, right? You want to create momentum. Hope creates momentum. So think about how are you inviting hope in that conversation? So some ways, you know, we all like to build questions. So questions that are energizing, that are open-ended, that help you stay in a conversation. So avoiding some of the why questions, unless you're doing the five whys. Avoiding the why, you know, why did you do that, Tracy? Is very, I don't know, challenging, right? It, it's, it puts her in a spot to explain to me. Yes. Whereas if I said to her, um, tell me your process of coming to this decision, it's a whole different thing. Now, I don't know about you, words like volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity really push my buttons. I can stop feeling cortisol in me. So what I have started doing when, when this stuff comes up is to reframe. So the V is vision. When you, you can gentle the volatility when you allow people to figure out how the dailiness of their work or their role fits in with their purpose and it fits in with the organization mission. It changes the conversation, hope appears. You can replace the uncertainty with understanding and this understanding is awareness of how we each are getting in our own way because the way we get in our own way is how we are getting in someone else's way. So think about with care and compassion and kindness, how do we challenge ourselves and challenge other people? For me, the C is clarity. And the clarity is not so much about the outcome or the focus or the goal. The clarity is what behaviors are we willing to accept and how can we call out, what are, what's the process of calling out unproductive behaviors? We are practiced about giving kudos, unpracticed about calling out unproductive behaviors. And I have a really very heartwarming story. Do I have a time for a story or should I skip? Okay. Yes, so we have a few more minutes. Yes. Okay. So here is my heartwarming story about this uh, uh, creating social agreements. Uh, so there's a school called the Other Side Academy, and uh, it is a residential two and a half year program for persistent offenders, addicts, and people experiencing homelessness. People, uh, students have been arrested about 25 times or so. They have a phenomenal success rate uh, despite these complicated histories that the students come with. They haven't had a single incidence of violence. All their students test negative for drugs. And this is, these are their words that despite explosive sexual histories, the campus is as chaste as a convent. I just thought that was funny. Um, and the reason they say is 200% accountability. What they mean by that is I'm 100% accountable for what I'm prepared to put out there and take that emotional risk for because it's worthwhile. Anything that's worthwhile takes risk. And I am 100% for your behaviors too because I care enough about you to call out the unproductive behaviors. So if we can get to a point where we are all saying to each other that 
the only way we can get into trouble is if we don't speak up. That would be a positive goal or a worthwhile goal to really have. So the clarity is in our social agreements with each other for that heart connection. From neuroscience perspective, really, really quickly, when two cells from different hearts are taken and kept in one petri dish, over time, the two cells start beating a common beat. Now, isn't that powerful? So heart connectedness is a real thing. We are capable of doing this. And the last piece is replace ambiguity with the agility. So, you know, when people say to me, oh my gosh, when will we go back to normalcy and I'll, you know, how we used to know, the reality is we really weren't in control. What we are in control are the responses and our attitude. So all we can do is treat the moment that's in front of us and believe that it's as complete as it needs to be right in this moment. The past is all about shoulds and coulds. The future activates the amygdala because we're thinking all this could go wrong. So all we can do is stay where our feet are. So stay where our feet are is a really good mantra or, or thing to think about because that allows us to pick up that wholehearted bone. So in the end, as we close out with a lot of gratitude, I'm making a case for hope as a strategy because my, my biggest big thing, it invites a pause. When you introduce that pause, you build joy, you promote curiosity, you connect your resiliency. When that happens, you bring belonging. So people are looking at discretionary effort, innovation, and then you nurture purpose. When that happens, there's a shift from scarcity to abundance. So with that, and with a lot of gratitude uh, for all of you for being here, I'm asking you, what resonates with you with this practice and what will you commit to? I love it, Sunitha. Thank you so much. I um, love the slide, first of all. Um, and I think these are wonderful strategies to really think about what we can do to build hope. Um, and I love your question, what practice will you commit to? So that is your homework, unless you would like to share something in our last few minutes in the chat, what practice will you commit to? And while you're thinking about that, why don't we cover the last few slides, Sunitha, that we have. Um, so we have a webinar coming up next month, how to make it easy for people to master continuous improvement. We're highlighting a master black belt, Amanda Zimmer Zimmerman, joining us all the way from New Zealand. She's going to talk about how to make it easier to get continuous improvement. We also want to share on the next slide our latest episode, podcast episode uh, with Nick Katko and we are, and Mike DeLuca, and they're talking about their new book, Practicing Lean Accounting. Um, if you're not into accounting, I thought it was very interesting anyway. Um, and a lot of the things that they are sharing are really make a lot of sense in terms of process improvement. And also for anyone that has to do any accounting, which we all do um, at some point in our lives. And then, and then lastly, just thank you for joining this webinar today. We have a few more minutes. So Sunitha, a lot of people are asking for these slides. They really like them. We don't share the slides. So where can they get a hold of you, Sunitha, if, you, if they would like to? What would be the best way to um, reach you? Email. And what is and your I, email? I can put it in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and, and so, I'm okay with sharing uh, a PDF of my s slides. And, you know, all I ask is if you're planning to actually use it in some fashion outside, then um, let me know. Yes. Uh, talk to good. me. Uh, so that, that, that would be the. So her would, email is Naranyan, Naranyan Sunitha 4 at gmail.com. I want to thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I really enjoyed this content, Sunitha. It was very timely for me as well. I'm recovering from a cold and feeling <clears throat> feeling like I needed to be energized and your webinar energized me enough. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that I will get better soon and I'm feeling better. <laughs> I'm sending you healing intentions as well. <laughs> thank you, Sunitha, and thank you everyone else. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.